Welcome to Garden Management Myth. I'm your attractive host. You cannot see me right now, but trust me, I am just totally stunning right now. I'm Benjamin Vogt. I own Monarch Gardens, LLC. That's a prairie-inspired design firm based out of eastern Nebraska. So, I have seven myths for you today. Are you ready? Let's just plow through them and look at what we got. So, we're going to look at the, these myths right here. Wood mulch prevents weeds. Plants need fertilizer. We need to amend all soil into a rich, loose loam that you commonly see in nursery pots. We need to clean up in autumn. Space plants according to tags. Garden by hardiness zone. And pulling weeds means less weeds. Oh my goodness, those are myths. Well, yes, if you like low-maintenance, sustainable design, absolutely, I've got better techniques to share with you today. So, wood mulch prevents weeds, okay? The main perspective is that when you have a layer of wood mulch, you're going to have no weeds or far fewer weeds. Now, to some degree, that's true. Mulch does help suppress weeds, um, but really only at really thick levels. Uh, we don't recommend more than four inches. If you're on clay soil, not more than one or two inches. Um, but if you start to have six inches or a crazy 12-inch layer of mulch, what's going to happen is that you're just going to have weed seeds germinating in the mulch because you've basically made a soil bed. So that's point number one right there, right? So when you have a really thick layer of mulch, um, you're also going to be inhibiting water and air transfer between the soil and the atmosphere. You absolutely don't want that. You don't want the mulch absorbing all the water so it's not getting down to the soil. Now, while mulch can help regulate soil temperature as well as soil moisture, um, it's better just to have plants doing the work. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, of course, wood mulch can float away. I've had plenty of heavy rainstorms and I come out and the wood mulch is just, you know, in the neighbor's lot or something, okay? Now something else we don't think about is number three here is wood mulch actually keeps plants in a perpetual state of near infancy. So what's happening is it's actually preventing plants from spreading and in some cases rooting out. So in the landscapes I design, these naturalistic spaces that are sort of emulating nature, how nature looks, but also how nature functions, we want the plants to reproduce. We want them to spread and we want them to seed around. That's part of the thinking, right? We don't want to have to come in and add plants every year because, hey, that costs a lot of money. And, 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 and you certainly want, don't necessarily want to do that yourself because, you know, hey, you're tired, right? you got other things to do. Let the garden maintain itself. So when we have the mulch on the, on the soil, that's preventing seeds from germinating. A lot of, a lot of uh, forb flower seeds need sunlight to germinate. So if we, die, if we have the mulch on the ground, that's not happening. We want our plants to touch. We want them to feel each other. We want them to c communicate with one another. And that's why we have plants close together. So what we want to do to combat weeds then is to use plants. We want to use plant layers. Look at what nature is doing out in, in woodlands, uh, forests, preserves, prairies, meadows around you. You don't see plants <laughs> covered in lots of mulch. Nobody's, nobody in nature, you know, the groundhogs and the beavers and, and, the, and the hawks are not bringing in mulch for all the plants, right? We have plant layers. We have ground covers. We got short plants. We have medium height plants. We got taller plants. They have a mix of shrubs and short trees and tall trees and all these layers are doing the mulching for you. They're shading the ground, keeping it cool, out competing weeds in that shade, as well as out competing weeds for soil nutrients and resources because the plant roots are taking those resources away from weeds. So we want thick, lush gardens just like the one you see in this picture here. Now, an initial layer of mulch or planting is fantastic. We use it all the time, an inch or two on our clay soils that we have out here in eastern Nebraska. That's great, especially for a sunny location where that mulch is going to decompose a lot faster than if it's a shade location. So, but even better would be like leaf mold or even maybe a layer of compost or something like that. An inch or so would be fine, but really you're not going to, to need it in the long run if you're planting thick layers of plants. And we'll talk more about that here in a couple slides. Now we use flower plugs. We use a mix of, of, of flower plugs and, and small pots along with seeding. That's how this uh, backyard uh, suburban meadow was done here. 
So he did a couple hundred plugs of flowers, you know, put them in, in drifts and masses right where he wanted them and where he wanted them to spread from. And then we sowed in some little blue stem Seidolt's grama and a few other short grasses that didn't do as well as Seidolt's grama and little blue stem. So you can see after three years, we have a nice thick layer here of plants, and it will shift and change every year, which is, which is just the awesome fact of naturalistic gardens like this. And all these plants are continuing to add nutrients into the soil um, and communicating with soil life and building soil life so that our clay soil will, over time, even just a couple of years actually, will be able to drain much more effectively and, and hold a lot more nutrients and hold a lot more water, no matter what the season is. Now, a lot of times we're also using biennials or even annuals as sort of a um, nurse crop for the first year or two that a, a garden is establishing. Black-eyed Susans are great for that. Um, so are Mexican hat coneflowers. Uh, that's the red version on the right, but there's also the yellow kind. So we'll seed these in um, at a decent rate so they can, they can start to, at least the basal foliage on the ground that first year will grow and start to outcompete um, for some of, the, some of the weeds that we might have popping up, some of the seeds that will be germinating after we've disturbed the soil on an install. And then the second year, the benefit is we just have this huge flush of flowers. Because a lot of the perennial um, plugs and small potted forbs that we're using, they just, you know, it takes them a couple years to get going, usually three to four before they get to the full size to, to flower and put on the beautiful display that we all expect to see in gardens. So we can be using these annual and biennial plants in the first year or two, sowing them in to sort of be our temporary green mulch. And over time, they certainly absolutely will give way as the density of the landscape builds and fills in. There's just no room for them to germinate. The next myth is plants need fertilizer. Now, I'm, sh you know, that that's just what we've been taught, right? You put a plant in the ground, you need to fertilize it. You need to keep fertilizing at certain times of the year. Um, the problem with fertilizer is it may actually overstimulate growth of native plants so that plants don't live as long or that they get too tall and flop over and they're just way too robust for what they're used to. A lot of our native plants, especially prairie and meadow plants, like a lean soil. That's what they've evolved with. They love clay, right? They, they love even sandy loam. It just depends on the plant. So what you want to be doing is carefully matching the plant to the site, right? You want to be thinking about sunlight, drainage, um, soil, what the other plants are going to be nearby. How are they going to help or hinder one another? And this is how you do not need to use fertilizer. Fertilizer, it uses uh, so much water, um, so, so much uh, fossil fuels in production, and then it's just it's, it's releasing these things back into the air as it degrades in the environment. So let's not use it. Even on a new build, um, I guess I'm starting to waffle <laughs> the more I do this, but if you have a new house and you've got this compacted clay soil and the top soil has been stripped away, and it might not have the nutrients some of the plants need. Now that's why you do a soil test, right? You want to figure out what's in that soil and then be able to match the plants more effectively to those conditions. Um, I'm usually, if it's a more established site, if you come in and till, you're just you're destroying soil layers, you're destroying soil life, and that's something you don't want to do uh, on a landscape that's been established for 5, 10, 15 years or longer. Now on a new site like this, if it's just really uh, lacking a lot of nutrients, can till in um, a foot or two uh, of compost and that compost how much you use depends on what your soil analysis is going to show you so um, but you don't necessarily have to do this on my own home I had that compacted clay heavy tractors driving over it nonstop for months and months um, just made sure to choose plants I knew were going to thrive in a clay and bust through that clay and even though I had standing water the first year or two, by about the years three, four, and five, I had absolutely no standing water in my garden. Even after several inch rainfall, that water would drain away in just a couple of hours because the roots were opening up that soil and amending it naturally. Plants are wonderful. Plants are useful. In fact, our prairie grasses lose up to one third of their roots every year. Those roots die. Now that's adding a lot of organic matter into the soil and again, opening the soil up for air and water to be transferred through. So fantastic what plants can do for us. So another myth in uh, garden management and maintenance is that we need to clean up in the, autumn, in the autumn. Okay, look guys, your garden is not the living room after the kids go to bed, okay? You can leave the toys out, leave the plants out. Why? 
Well, for hollow stem plants, water can't get down into the crown, down into those stems, and freeze and hurt the, pl hurt the plant. That's going to happen if you cut back the garden in the fall, so don't do that. The stems that we leave up, and all the leaves and all that stuff, those stems that we leave up in the, in the fall gather snow in the winter and helps insulate plants and hibernating insects, spiders, frogs, and all that good stuff. And, and when that snow melts in the spring, that's going to provide moisture and nutrients to the soil. There's actually nutrients in the snow. It's fantastic stuff. Eat some for dinner. Just not the yellow kind, right? Gardens look better in winter when we leave it up. Brown is a color. Snow graces seed heads and grasses, and there's just so much wonder to experience and see, okay? That's called winter interest. It's wonderful. If you mow things back, if it looks like your neighbor's front lawns, how dreadful and boring and sad and depressing is that? You'll never make it through winter if you don't leave your garden up just to see that textural interest. Now, of course, number five there, birds eat seeds from spent blooms. So if you don't have bird feeders out, have plants. Plants are bird feeders. And besides, look here, you're tired in the fall. You don't want to clean up the garden. It's been a long summer. Don't do it. Leave it. Another management myth is paying attention and, f and, and following plant tags. I know, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? I, every time a plant tag comes with a plant, I just throw it out immediately and, and do my research online because I can guarantee you those plant tags are not going to be as helpful to your specific region as doing research on your specific region online. A prairie drop seed is going to grow different in, in one state than another state. Same thing with latras and coneflower and all these different species of forbs and grasses and sedges. So what I like to do is just also ignore. So if they say plant on 12 to 24 inches, I just cut that in half at least. We want our plants put closely together because the sooner they glow, grow together and interlock, the sooner we're going to have less weed pressure and the more we're going to have the soil shaded, soil moisture staying in. So plant tightly. In fact, I plant everything on 12 inch centers or less. Depends on the site. Sometimes I'll go down to 8 inches. We want that packed in tight. Some of my favorite resources to research plants to know how they grow in my region, what they're going to do over several years, and, and, and even how they grow alongside other plants are these here. Prairie Moon Nursery, Illinois Wildflowers, Missouri Botanical Garden, Lady Bird Johnson Weld Center, and a wonderful book, Field Guide to Wildflowers in Nebraska and the Great Plains, sort of our Bible out here in Nebraska, but also the entire Great Plains. And even a lot of those plants extend all the way to the east coast of the Atlantic Ocean. We share so many of the same native plants east of the Continental Divide. Another myth is that we should be gardening by hardiness zone. Now, gardening by USD hardiness zone is great if you're using exotic plants because you're trying to, um, to match plants from other continents, right? So that's going to be a great, great baseline break, uh, guide for you to figure out you know, how, how to match from these other areas where the ecosystems don't necessarily match up here. Now I'm going to show you another way to do this. Notice how, for the most part, these USD hardiness zones are strictly horizontal. And we know, we know why they're horizontal, right? Because temperature gradients are basically south to north. OK, so it's horizontal. This is how you should be gardening. Ecoregions. This is level three ecoregions. There are four. One is, is looks a lot like the hardiness zones. Level three here is getting pretty darn specific, OK? So you want to find your ecoregion on this map and study the plants that are in that ecoregion. That way, you're making sure that you're using the right plants adapted to your climate as well as the right plants adapted to the local wildlife around you. Because I'm sure if you're gardening with native plants, one of your main goals isn't just sustainability and low maintenance, but it's supporting wildlife. Now let's zoom in. You can do ecoregion four. It gets even messier, does it? Doesn't it? I'm looking over here in eastern Nebraska, and I see uh, uh, is there one or two right in there. Got some riparian areas, and they got that tall grass prairie. Tall grass prairie goes all the way from Canada down to Texas, but there's a specific ecoregion tall grass prairie right here in eastern Nebraska. So here's another myth: hand pull those weeds. Do you know what happens when you hand pull weeds? Yeah, well, the weeds are gone. Yes, that's right. But you're also disturbing the soil. The worst thing you can do in a bed that's trying to establish is disturb the soil. What you do when you pull a weed is you bring up buried weed seeds that are now going to germinate because they have sunlight. You're also creating with that soil that you bring up a nice, wonderful bed of fresh soil for weed, weed seeds to blow in on and germinate. That's a twofer. We don't want to do that. 
This bed here is infested, infested. I gotta use my English correctly, don't I? It's infested with nut sedge. That's a common, common issue, even though this was a, a lawn landscape that was probably pesticided and herbicided to death. So you can weed some of this if it's a small bed if you want to. You're probably gonna wanna come back in and do another layer of mulch or put in more plants or something. Even better would be just to, you know, clip the seed heads. This is a backyard meadow, which you saw several slides ago at uh, Monarch Gardens headquarters, my home. Now, the first year that this uh, meadow was being uh, established, we had a lot of foxtail weeds coming up. Now, foxtail is an annual. It's no big deal, right? And I probably could have left all the seed heads because in the next year or two, the plants just would have outcompeted the seeds that the foxtail seeds that were in the ground, and they never would have had a chance to germinate. But I went through meticulously about once a week and probably clipped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of foxtail seed heads. I did that by hand. If you have a larger space, a mower will work as long as you're ma making sure that mower is sucking up the seeds that you're going through and clipping. But know your plants is what I'm saying. Know your weed plants. Because if it's just an annual, don't worry about it. If it's an invasive perennial, then you got to be more aggressive. Maybe you spray, maybe you do have to hand pull that. On new sites, look you're always going to have weed pressure that first year or two. It's just a given. But if you don't work hard to manage that first year or two, the garden is going to fail, and you're just setting yourself up for, for failure many years down the road, and you practically have to restart the landscape. So that first year weeding, it is incredibly important. These are the kind of landscapes you can expect to see, right? thick and lush and ready for beautiful winter interest. We gotta rethink gardens and our landscapes. We gotta rethink what pretty is. If we're spacing the plants far apart, they're not gonna be able to communi communicate, they're not gonna be able to touch, they're not gonna be able to give us the low maintenance, sustainable landscape we are truly looking for. If you've enjoyed this short video, you can get way more information on these online classes that are available at monarchguard.com. Starting your native plant garden, that's just not for beginners, um, that's not just for newbies, it's for intermediate people looking to restart, re-jump uh, their landscape. Lots of new methods, lots of new strategies. Pollinator gardening with native plants, the best native plants for pollinators, native pollinators especially. Woody natives with year-round value. Fall, winter, spring, summer. We're talking structure and leaf color, berries and flowers. Designing a fall and winter garden. Strategies to make your garden look beautiful and the right plants to put in there. Designing for wildlife and sustainability. Tons of strategies on how to design your garden for less work, to have it be able to face climate change much more easily and successfully, and then how to facilitate wildlife habitat in your landscape. Thank you so much for listening today. Hopefully you'll visit me. If not, happy gardening.